Yeah, so I'm Louise, and today I'm going to be presenting um, about my bioconductor package, um, TREG, um, which is uh, tools for helping find total RNA expression genes in uh, single nucleus data. Um, yeah. Um, through the link on the spreadsheet, um, we have a Google Doc that has some um, uh, some packages that you need to install. So a quick note, like to um, install Treg, you need to be updated to, um, let me share my screen here. You need to be updated to R4.2 so you can uh, use Bioconductor uh, 315. Um, yeah. So I don't know if anybody has questions about that. That's a little bit of a process. So I don't know if we have time to go over that now, but um, once you have uh, 315 installed, you should be able to use um, this uh, top command to install TREG. Um, you also need to install single cell experiment um, as well to interact with the single cell object. And then we also need a couple other packages, including um, P heat map, Dippler, uh, GD plot to tidy and table just to check out this data a little bit. Um, cool. All right. Um, yeah, so then um, also on here, I have links to um, the website for this package, um, research.libd.org, uh, TREG. And so this is our homepage for this website. And we have um, our readme and uh, a vignette. And then I also have a link to our vignette um, which is pretty easy to find from this website. And then um, all, as well as our preprint. Um, and then just a little bit of code to help us get started here, which is um, how to download and get started with that first part of uh, the, just to download and prep the data, um, which is just a little bit of filtering. Um, so does anybody have any questions before we jump into that? All right, cool. Um, yeah, so I think backing up a little bit, um, just going over the purpose of TREG. Um, so the goal of TREG is to help us find candidate total RNA expression genes um, um, in a single nucleus or single cell RNA-seq data. Um, so why would you wanna do that? So the idea behind this is to um, help facilitate more data like being able to like collect more data from us um, SM fish experiment using RNA scope. Um, so we wanted to be able to measure the, or at least quantify total RNA expression in a, um, in a nucleus, like in RNA scope. So what we did, uh, but in RNA scope, you can only measure a few genes at a time. So we um, wanted to find a gene that could help us measure all the genes but only using one gene, if that makes sense. Um, so the idea was we need to find a genes whose expression um, had a nice relationship to the total, or it was you know, um, related to the total RNA expression in that cell. And how we can measure that in SMFish or RNA scope is by counting the number of puncta that then appear on the, um, on the, the nucleus. So they kind of appear as is like these white points of light in the in the photo, and um, using a software, we're able to count them up. So we can kind of differentiate, differentiate um, nuclei with less expression or more expression. Um, so we hypothesize that, um, like, okay, how could we find such a gene? Uh, we wanted to be able to look at single nucleus data and um, like kind of pick one out. So we thought that a gene with that quality would probably also have um, mostly non-zero expression in most cells. So, you know, we'd be able to actually detect expression in most cells and that would actually be useful. Um, we're able to quantify for most cells across different cell types and different tissue types. Um, different tissue types was specific to like our interest in the brain. And we wanted to look at a couple different um, tissues, um, but the overall idea of TREG is, is that they're probably pretty specific. A TREG that works well for the brain probably wouldn't work for like skin or liver or something like that, um, but we haven't really tested that too much, but um, we do think that they're probably tissue specific. Um, we also wanted to see, we also suggested that a TREG could be expressed at a constant level in respect to other genes. Um, 
other genes across different cell types. Um, and that would be have high rank invariance. So what we mean by that is that if you rank the expression of all the genes in a cell and give everything a number, um, and then uh, look across all the different cells, um, we think genes that would make good tregs are like always going to have like a similar rank. Um, so if you plot that here, a gene with high invariance um, will rank will have like a really tight distribution and a gene with low invariance will have like a spread. So we're looking for a gene with this quality. Um, and then we also want um, this gene to be like back, moving back towards like the um, actually measuring it in uh, some fish experiment. We want it to be measurable as a continuous metric. Um, so actually being able to like quantify all of these. Um, so, but this is kind of something that is beyond what we can um, predict in single nucleus data. And we actually have to like get into the actual, um, like micro, you know, take, take those pictures, get into the SM fish experiment before we really know if there's anything um, that will prevent that from happening. Um, so these two, we hope we can, uh, we can check out using um, this package and looking at our single nucleus data. And then this third um, metric is like um, something that needs to be experimentally evaluated. Um, yeah, so then we came up with this kind of um, workflow to kind of predict this rank invariance metric. Um, so um, kind of the brief overview of this is that we start with the single count data um, or the count data for our single nucleus or single cell data. And then we filter anything that has pretty low expression. Um, so we filter out the bottom half of expression. And then we also filter for genes with high proportions of, or we filter um, to include genes with low proportions of zero. So kind of that first point that we want these genes to be expressed in almost every cell, um, in almost basically every cell. And an issue with single nucleus data is that it's often very sparse. There's lots and lots of zeros. Um, so to kind of avoid, so we wanted to like filter for the best there, um, look for things that are expressed um, pretty universally. Um, so then um, we're moving on to the part where we calculate the rank invariance portion. So working with one cell type at a time, we first find the rank of the row mean for that gene. Um, so if, you know, these are our little, if each row is a gene here, um, the colors kind of represent like the rank. So this would be like the highest expressed gene four to one, um, that kind of like, um, base R generic function for rank ranks things from high to low. Um, so we'd get four is like our highest ranking. Um, and then we'd also rank each cell. So this is combining the mean of all of the genes in this red cell type or I guess like get yeah, the mean of all of those cells in the red cell type for gene one is represented here versus here we're ranking over each cell. So here uh, gene one is still the highest, but for cell one, we have a tie. Um, and then the next thing we wanna do is find the difference between these ranks. So the thought there is that if um, the gene is consistently ranked, the difference will be very small. Um, so we're looking for lower numbers here. Um, so yeah, we find the difference between the rank of each cell and this mean difference. So we end up with a matrix that is um, genes times cells. And then here we get the row mean of, the, of those absolute differences. Um, so again, looking for small numbers, and then we rank these row means, um, and then we rank all of those together. And then, um, so then you repeat all of these steps for each cell type. So for the red cell type, the blue cell type, and the yellow cell type. So this is kind of like, finding something, okay, great, it's stable in the red cell type, but is it stable in the blue and yellow cell type as well? Um, and then from there, we find the, we sum up across the row and then we find the reverse rank. So we're looking for the highest number then, which would mean that this is the lowest, has like the lowest difference across cell types and then has these highest rank invariance score. So that's the process. It's a little twisty turvy. Um, and, um, but we've kind of built some um, our functions to kind of tackle that process for you. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? All right, cool. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, um, we built a couple functions that um, 
tackle this process for you. Um, so if we check out the function, uh, the reference functions. Um, so if you're on the Treg website, you can check out the reference tab. And this brings you to this. So we have a couple of functions. One, uh, this first one, filter proportion zero, or I guess you gotta have this, you start with get proportion zero, and then you filter with that proportion zero. And then, um, okay. And then for, so that's like this first step. And then we have this function, uh, um, rank cells, which does this step. So fil uh, ranks the genes by cell. And then we have rank group. So that ranks the um, expression of those genes by each group. So here, in a common definition of group, we think will be cell type, um, but perhaps it's like cell type and region. Um, maybe there's other groups of interest that you're interested in finding stable genes across. Um, so that's what rank group does. And then rank invariance um, takes the output of both of these and does this whole part. Um, uh, it does like the, this bottom row essentially, and then gets you your rank scores. And then we also have this function, um, rank invariance express, which um, does the whole, uh, combines the um, rank group and rank cell functions and rank invariance and kind of it's the express version um, and does the whole calculation. And it's a little bit faster because it can do it all in one loop. Um, so yeah, so those are, and then this is just the little, uh, example. Um, so that's like the contents of the package. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, I'm just going to go over uh, kind of like the example that we have in our vignette. Um, so, uh, so the top of this vignette um, kind of like has uh, notes about installing TRAG, um, some like required knowledge about using things like summarized experiment and uh, single cell experiment. Um, I'm assuming that people here are pretty comfortable with those packages. Um, and I think that, that we have our stats clubs on how to handle those I, uh, either way. Um, then we also have citation. And then um, I think some of the other notes that are some of the other things that are noted in our readme um, and then we get into this example application um, so i guess before we get going with the demo um, yeah does anybody have any any questions on i guess like the concept or overview before we get into the demo hey louise can you hear me all right cool mm -hmm. Hey, Luis, I think Kynan okay. just asked a question. Oh. Got Zoom, everyone always in the way. Here we go. Okay, so I've just copied out some of the, the code um, that I have I don't think Luis on the Google Doc here. Um, so we're gonna start with that. So this is just, uh, and then also um, load up the libraries that are, uh, that I noted for installation. Um, so, Um, so yeah, so single cell experiment, we need to um, deal with, uh, you know, single cell experiment um, as tools to let us interact with the um, data set that we're going to import. Um, P heat map um, or pretty heat map is just help us visualize a couple things. Um, Dippler as well as ggplot2 and then Gip, Dippler, tidyr, and Tibble are just like have some tools that um, help us manipulate some tables to kind of look at some different features of the data as we go. Um, yeah, and then we're just going to, then this top part, um, the BioC file cache, we're going to download um, um, the DLPFC data from the Tran Maynard single cell or single nucleus rather um, data set. Oh. Okay, so like I mentioned, um, we're going to use an example data set from um, Matt Tran and Kristen Maynard's um, 10x pilot from the single nucleus. Uh, so they have a data set, a pretty cool data set that is um, single nucleus data across five different um, human brain regions. 
And we're just gonna focus on the dorsal laterate prefrontal cortex or DLPFC data here. So let's just just gonna download that. All right, cool. So now I think that we actually have our object. Um, all right, cool. We're in business. Um, okay, yeah, so like I mentioned, um, what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna drop a couple of the cell types. Um, there are a few like pretty rare cell types in this data set. Um, um, yeah, so, is this screen big enough for everybody to see? Or maybe zoom in a touch. Okay, yeah. So there's a couple cell types in here that are like a um, couple things that might not be great for us. So there's some cell types that are pretty closely related, namely these excitatory neurons. Um, so we have like excitatory A through F, and then we have inhibitory A through F. Um, so some of these are pretty rare, like inhibitory E here. We only have what, seven? Um, so like I mentioned, single nucleus data is pretty sparse. So we have that little data to work with. It can get kind of hard and like noisy. Um, so what we're going to do is first combine these cell types. Um, just um, so all the excitatories are going to become one group and all the inhibitories are going to become one group. Um, and then, um, and we're also going to drop cell types that are under, um, that we're once after we do that broad cell type, we're going to drop anything that's under um, 50 cells just because it's like not quite enough data um, from what we've seen to like get good results. Um, well, what happens if you just drop the cell types that have less than 50 cells instead of combining? Because um, it would probably work. I think that as far as um, like this process goes, um, like we're trying to find things that are like evenly expressed across. So I think having like these similar cell types separated out um, would probably, I, I don't know, we haven't tested it too closely, but I assume you'd probably get um, similar things because excitatory A and excitatory B are pretty similar cell types. Um, so like rather than like a marker gene finding between excitatory A and excitatory B is like hard. I think finding a trig that would work between these might not be too bad, um, but that's kind of uh, speculation. Um, uh, we just did work at that. That's like the cell type level that we were interested in, like finding between astrocytes and excitatory, um, because down the line that makes sense for our experimental like question as well. So I think that's another reason that we did that. Um, so. Uh, uh, does your, uh um wiki or i guess maybe the paper suggests that you you get rid of cell types less than 50 less than um 50 yeah in the than. um in the vignette yeah we do uh we have a section wow like we drop we we say that like we drop this less than 50 groups um in the preprint i don't i think we did mention that and then we also have like um for like the overall experiment we did the, the filtering step gets a little tricky because like I mentioned, it's, it's really sparse. So those rare cell types like don't have a lot of counts at all. So when you filter, you lose them. So we actually combined like rare cell types across regions um, to try to like bulk up the data. Um, but as far as like, uh, um, like just one cell type at a time, I'm not sure. Um, I forgot to copy this one over, but um, so this is the, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to just like G sub off any of the um, underscore letters off the end of this cell type, um, replace that with nothing. And then um, that's going to be saved under this uh, cell type broad category. Um, and then if we table that up, we get uh, kind of a more simple frame. So um, 
yeah, once again, like this was kind of our experimental question, like um, astrocyte excitatory inhibitory, like this kind of level of cell, cell types um, was what we were interested in. Um, so then here, uh, here I'm just finding anything, any of the cell types that are have less than 50, like 50 nuclei. Um, sorry if I get a little, uh, working with nuclei here, um, it's like easy to be a little sloppy nuclei versus cells. Um, but uh, yeah, so here we're looking for things with under 50 nuclei. Um, so macrophages, mural and T cells are pretty rare populations um, in this data set for this region. So um, we're going to drop them. And then after we do that, we end up with our final list. Um, so this is like the data set that we're going to move forward with. Okay, so now we're going to move on to filtering. So the first step we're going to do is just filter for the top 50% of expression. Um, um, so in the vignette, I kind of I did some visualizations of like how sparse this data is. Um, I don't know if we have quite enough time or people want to watch that. Um, but like this data at this point is like 80% sparse or 88. So like uh, in that count matrix, like 80% of stuff like is zeros. Um, so just quickly, like um, here we're just pulling out the counts assay and just seeing like what is zero, summing that up and then just like dividing that by like the total number of counts that are in there. Um, Yeah, so we're dealing with like 88%. So like only 22% of the, or I guess like 12% of anything actually has uh, counts. So um, like I said, very sparse. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is just um, find the filter for that top 50% expression. Um, so we can do that by finding the, uh, uh, let's just go. Um, um, so we're just going to find like the, uh, the row means. I refresh my R now. Nothing's working. Um, no, no, you have an extra. It kind of looks like there might be an an extra co comma in the wrong area. Oh no, I missed. It's no. assay. It's not assay. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So now we just have like the mean expression for each of these genes across all of those cells, or nuclei rather. And um, basically what we're just gonna do is like find the median of that. And then everything that's above the median, we're gonna keep everything below the median, we're going to uh, exclude. Um, so basically just like redefining what, Yeah, cool. So now if we redo our sparsity calculation, it's a little better, um, but not it's still pretty sparse. Um, okay, so then why we're gonna- not, back, uh, Why don't you just remove all the zero, genes with zero expression? Um, see, I'm not sure how much, um, 
You mean just like anything that's all the way zero? Yeah, all the genes that are zero, they, they don't have any count to filter uh, out all genes that have zero. Well, I know that like the next step is definitely going to remove everything that's like all the way zero. Um, uh, so I guess like we have a lot with means are that are equal zero. I don't know if anything is truly zero all the way across. Um, I guess we could do like at this point, the, I guess like the max. No, that wouldn't work because we'd have to go be row max or something. Um, yeah, I mean, like this next step where we take out anything with the proportion zero, um, like under 75, like that's going to remove anything that's all the way zero. Um, that's going to remove anything that's like um, mostly zero, uh, if that makes sense. Um, so the proportion zero basically is going to like um, look across the group, at, like for. Um, like for the astrocytes, for instance, like any genes that are 75% zero within the astrocytes gets eliminated. Um, so like anything that would be 100% zero within the astrocytes would also get removed. So anything that's 100% zero is definitely going to be removed at this point. Um, so like, uh, that's like a good suggestion, but we definitely uh, uh, go above and beyond on that filter. Um, cool. So yeah, moving on to that part. So now we're going to start using some actual trig, um, uh, functions. So, uh, next thing we're going to do is just, uh, get our proportion zeros. Okay, so the inputs are your uh, SCE object, and then um, you give it your group call. Did I actually load this package? And no, I didn't. Then we're going to use that cell type broad um, uh, column that we just um, or defined up here. Um, and then this takes a second to run. So um, it's going to return a table for us that is um, like for uh, it's each gene, and then it's going to give us uh, each row is a gene. Um, and then each column is a group. So here, each group is a cell type. Um, and then it's, that's going to give us the proportion zero um, for each group. And then how our filtering works is that um, we define a proportion zero um, that we think is a good cutoff, um, just observing some graphs. Uh, uh, we think that like 75 is a pretty good cutoff. Um, we can go through the graphing here. Um, yeah, so we get a table that is um, the rows are each of the genes in this data in the data set, and then the columns are each cell type. And then here we can see the proportion zero. So, like for instance, here, like you know, at least ninety six percent of the counts for astrocytes for this first gene aren't um, zero. So that's looking pretty good. And then across this whole column, or actually no, the opposite. 96% are zeros. Um, so I got that backwards. So if we look across this column, I think astrocytes actually are our maximum here. So the maximum proportion zero for this gene would be 96%. So if we're filtering to 75% proportion zero, like it has to be under 75% is the maximum, this first gene gets cut. Um, so I think the second gene, you can see that it has like much more expression in excitatory, 23%, um, only 23% are zeros but it would still get dropped because we have 88% in astrocytes. Um, yeah, so as you can see, a lot of these have some big numbers, 99, 
98, 99, 99. So we end up with a lot. Um, so this is like a pretty, um, uh, it's a pretty intense, it's, it's a pretty, I guess like, what am I trying to say? Like specific filter. Uh, so to kind of like help us find like a cutoff, um, I'm throwing out 75, that's like the number we've used quite a bit, but um, to find that we had like kind of visualize the distribution of the proportion zeros. Um, so, uh, so to do that, I just made like this proportion zero column, uh, like long, um, top zero long, and then, uh, Okay, so yeah, we're just gonna kind of like transition into kind of like I guess Dippler style tables. So we're gonna throw those row names into a column or those genes, gene names into a column called gene, and then pivot long. Um, and then we're gonna exclude um, gene. Or it's not in quotes. Um, so this just like gives it a, uh, um, a better format for plotting what you do plot. Um, yeah, so we have the gene and then um, the cell type names becomes name and then value. So if we just um, uh, plot that as a histogram, Yeah, we can come up with kind of a distribution of, of those proportion zeros for each of our cell types. Um, so as you can see, we've got a lot of peaks around one. Um, you know, a lot of the shapes are like that. Um, for excitatory and inhibitory, which are more transcriptionally active cell types, uh, we see that kind of like shift a little bit more. So rather than really peak around, uh, you know, totally, totally sparse, we have like uh, a little bit of a softer peak. Um, so, but we know we still do have these tails in all of these cell types of, you know, genes that have like a considerable, you know, aren't all zero. Um, we have like some expression for. So basically like these are the genes that we want to capture. So we want to find genes that are in the tail for all of these six cell types. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, it kind of seems like 75 is a nice way to like exclude a lot of these peaks. Um, so that is the filter, filter that we're gonna move forward for. Um, not sure if this is how this data would look, uh, you know, if this is how data looks in other uh, data sets or like other tissues or something, but this is like what we've observed in the brain so far. All right, so now we're going to use another um, trig function, which is, um, filter proportion zero or filter prop zero. So we're gonna, and that returns just a list of genes that have that um, that pass that filtering step. So if we just define the list, and then um, filter proportion zero takes the table that we create with get proportion zero. So that's a pretty simple process. Filter prop zero, and then. Um, it just takes that object we defined, prop zero, um, and then we get a bit of cutoff equals 0 0.75. And you can see that we get uh, 
um, we filtered that whole data set down to like 1400 genes. So um, yeah, it's quite a strict filter. Um, does anybody have any questions about this step? No, no questions, but uh, I was wondering, I, I mean, we can probably all do the plotting you have, and I bet your vignette probably walks people through plotting the filter, but uh, it might be cool to also have a little, little function that does the exact plot you made. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Um, yeah, cool. I could, that's a good suggestion. I can try to uh, include that. All right. Um, yeah, so we're kind of on to that. Um, the second kind of stage of uh, trig finding, which is running the rank invariance. Um, so like I mentioned, there are, um, let me pull up my little diagram again. Oh yeah, wait, and then we might wanna, let's check out the sparsity again. Um, it's going to be quite a bit lower, but let's just check it out. Okay. Oh, it's still at seven seven. Okay. Well, you have oh, we didn't actually that. filter. That's right. Yeah. Um, we just got our length. Okay. So yeah. So now we're gonna go. Genes. Okay. Yeah, so now we're down to only 33%. So still in, uh, it's like definitely, I guess, what's that? Not sparse, dense, much more dense matrix now. Um, yeah, so if we go and we look back at our little workflow here, um, we're now at this this stage. So all that work just got us from here to here, but now we have like data that is like going to work better for the rest of our process. Um, yeah. So now we're going to do um, these next steps that get us to our rank invariance, which is like our final product here. Um, yeah. So now that we have our filtered um, uh, filtered SCE object, um, we can get the, we can do the rank invariance steps. So if you do the kind of broken down version, um, you get the, uh, calculate the group ranks. Or I guess we could call this cell type rank because that's what we're. Um, so our inputs are our SCE object. And then we tell it the group column, which is cell type broad. I think we've been using a lowercase b. Yeah. Oops. Is that true? Oh, Raj, just like a word I cannot type. Um, so there we go. Uh, yeah, so this is going to give us a list of lists. Um, all right, maybe I'll just do this here. So it's six and basically, um, We just want to look at that real quick using per to just navigate through those lists. Um, yeah, so it's going to give us a named list um, where that is going to be our cell type. Uh, the name of each list is by our group or cell type. And then um, the list is just the, um, the mean expression for each gene. So that's what we get there. Um, and then um, kind of and then the second step is that we're going to find 
the rank of each cell, or I guess nuclei rank. Ooh. Cells. So you want to give it the uh, same uh, input as basically like the same categories as you gave uh, the the um, rank group function. Um, so this gives us. Um, a little bit we could do. Let's just do the corner. Okay, so this gives us um, a list of tables then. Um, so now each column is a nucleus and then each row is a gene and then um, this is a list of six of these tables, one for each cell type. And then the final function, um, rank and variance, is going to um, give us the, uh, is going to combine these two objects into um, those final rank and variance scores. Um, so like I mentioned, yeah, so, um, now we have both of these tables. We have this rank row mean and rank cell type, but we have one for each of our uh, different cell types. And then this a third function, um, rank and variance, is going to combine all of these into this final uh, value. Yeah, so this just gives us um, then a value for each of the genes. And then um, and then we want to look for the genes with the highest values. So those are going to be our best candidate tregs. Um, Um, yeah, so this, this is our final output, um, is this list of genes. Um, so a couple things to note is that uh, we've uh, had some discussions with some um, people. Uh, MALAT1 seems to show up a lot in single nucleus data, especially single nucleus um, data from the brain. So um, it's kind of thought to be, it's like really associated with the nucleus and it's thought to maybe be like a technical artifact. So we've seen it come up in a lot of these uh, a lot of the regions, it's like really highly expressed in this data, but um, we think that it might it might be kind of like a problematic and isn't like a great result. So if you do run this and you get MALAT1, um, maybe just kind of ignore it. We've also, in actual experimentation, it's so highly expressed that it just comes up like, um, remember how we like you look for those individual white puncta on the nucleus? There's so many that it just turns into like a white blob, um, just like a blob of light, and you can't like differentiate the different points so you can't quantify them how we planned. Um, so that does not work great. So just fair warning about that one. Um, and then um, the second, uh, the, I guess like coming back to the code here, um, we also implemented a, uh, we can call it RA2, but basically have a function that combines the three steps above just into one single step. So the above process is kind of, is interesting if you wanted to explore like the internal, like how does the rank of the, you know, by cell type look, if you wanted to look at like distribution or heat maps across cells, it kind of like helps you do that. But if you just want to get right to the results, you can use rank and variance express, um, which just takes this input that we used for those first two functions.
um, and then it'll give you the exact same uh, results. Um, yeah, so if you just want to cut right to the chase, you can use this ranking variance express function, and it's a little bit quicker as well, and you get the same results. Um, so yeah, so then um, kind of exploring like the top 10 or 20 percent or 10 or 20 like genes we think are like good candidates. Um, and then um, like uh, we do like advise that people do like experimental validation because kind of like Malat one, we're not sure um, which genes are like totally compatible experimentally with like RNA scope or whatever like assay you might be interested in doing. But um, yeah, the package gets you this far. It gets you, like a good list of candidates. Um, so that's kind of, that's, that's what we built. Um, does anybody have any questions about um, the rank and variance calculation? 